If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I hope you do. I want to encourage you to open them to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. We're continuing our walk through the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 2. We have seen in the lineage of Christ, we've seen in the birth of Christ that Jesus is the King of the Jews. He's the promised descendant of Abraham. He's the promised descendant of David. He is the Jewish Messiah. Today, however, Matthew wants us to see that Jesus is not just the king of the Jews. He's not just the Jewish Messiah. He is the king of all kings. He is the Lord of all lords. He is the savior of the world. And he came not just for the Jews, but for the nations. And I don't know about you, but this is good news For those of us that can't trace our lineage back to Abraham, it's really good news that Jesus came to be the Savior of the world. We're reminded that Matthew is written primarily to a Jewish audience, but but what's interesting, at the end of the book, you'll remember in Matthew 28, and we'll get there about two years from now, we'll get there at some point, Matthew 28, you remember at the, the Great Commissioning, it was Jesus who said, uh, go into the world and make disciples of all the nations. And right here at the beginning of Matthew's gospel in Matthew chapter 2, the first group of people that Matthew will record who will come and worship at the feet of Jesus will be Gentile astrologers. Matthew wants us to know, yes, Jesus is the king of the Jews. Yes, he is the Jewish Messiah. But know this, he is the savior of the world. For God so loved the world. And you know, I thought about this too. In Luke's gospel, the first group that comes in worship is the shepherds. In Matthew's gospel, he records the first group as the magi. Isn't this beautiful? You have these lowly shepherds, basically a group of farmers, and you've got Gentile astrologers. You've got college professors and farmers both coming to worship at the feet of Jesus. Isn't that a beautiful picture of what Christ does? He draws all of us together from different backgrounds, different places, but we all, if we know Christ, at some point we met up at the feet of Jesus. So these magi, they are what we would call classic Gentiles. They're a group of men who were far away from God. They are distant, they're in the dark, but they're searching and the light of a star is going to shine into their life. God is going to draw them to, them to himself. They're going to respond. They're going to meet up with Jesus. And they will leave differently than when they came. Does that sound familiar to any of us that know Christ? A group of people who were far away living in darkness of sin. And God's light shone in our hearts. And he began to draw us to himself. And we responded to that drawing. We met up with Jesus. And we left differently than when we came. These magi, they represent us. They represent you and me. And they're a great picture of light in the midst of a dark day, the light of God shining into the world to draw in distant sinners to himself. Now, it's also important to remember as we study this text that the events that are recorded here probably occurred Uh, at least a year after the birth of Christ. Most of the time, if you have a nativity in your house, you have uh, the shepherds and you have the magi. It's like Grand Central Station right there at the stable. I hate to break it to you. It's not biblically accurate. You want to be biblically accurate, you got to take the magi and put them in the kitchen somewhere because they're not there yet. They're, They're coming. They're making their way over. But they're not yet there yet. They haven't yet arrived. Which also means that most of what we read in the Luke narrative occurs prior to this. Uh, The the traditional Christmas story that we read in Luke 2, most of that has already occurred. Meaning the shepherds have already come and worshipped. This is amazing to me. The first group of people that will get a, a call that the Savior has been born is the shepherds. The shepherds were lowly. They were not the upper class. These are the lowly. Can I ask you, who did you first call when your child was born? More than likely, you called people that you're closest to, the people that you love the most to announce that your son or your daughter had been born. 
the first group of people who are going to get a phone call that Christ has been born, that God's son has been born, will be a group of shepherds. What does that tell us? It tells us that God loves everybody. Isn't that a beautiful picture? So the shepherds have already come and worshipped. Not only that, but Jesus has been presented in the temple. This is recorded in Luke. Uh, the firstborn of a Jewish family was always, uh, firstborn male was always presented back to God. And you would go and you would offer sacrifices. Now, if you were poor, you just offered two turtle doves. Joseph and Mary are poor. They have nothing. They offer two turtle doves. How humiliating must this have been? The rest of the world doesn't have the knowledge, but they know that this child, they may not fully understand it, but he's going to be the sacrifice. Here they are offering the lowest of sacrifices for the one who would be the ultimate sacrifice of the world. So he's been presented to the temple, and you remember while he's at the temple, it's Anna and Simeon, these Old Testament saints that have been looking and longing for the birth of Messiah. That's, that was the talk of the Jewish nation. When would the Messiah be born? When's he coming? And these Old Testament saints, Simeon and Anna, they've been longing and looking for the Savior, and they find him, and they embrace him, and they worship him as king of all kings. But this morning... Matthew wants us to see these distant seekers, these magi drawn in by the light of a star to worship at the feet of Jesus. As we walk through this text, I want us to notice two very, two, two very simple things. Number one, I want us to understand the context because I think it's important, important for us to understand the context of their coming, of their introduction to Jesus. So we'll look some at the context in verses one through eight. And then the latter portion of this text, we'll see the conversion because these magi are gonna be converted. They're gonna leave differently than when they came. So it's a beautiful picture. So let's start by looking at the context. Would you read with me? Beginning in verse one, we'll read down through verse eight says right there, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw a star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me so that I too may come and worship him. The first thing that we really see about this context is that it is a a very dark day in the life of Israel. Herod is king. Israel is now a vassal state to the Romans. They are living as slaves in their own land, meaning they don't get to pick the high priest anymore. They don't get to pick who will be king. Rome appoints it. And so there's this one particular individual who will maneuver himself into a position to become prefect. And so Rome appoints him as prefect. He is not technically the king. He takes that title to himself. He doesn't like the title prefect. He would be rather he would rather be known as the king of the Jews so he just kind of assumes that title to himself now what's interesting about this is he has really no legal right to the throne he's just been appointed Uh, Herod is an Edomite his father was an Edomian he's an Edomite Uh, this is the descendants of Esau these are the descendants from which we get the Amalekites and they are one of the most despised enemies of the Jews Not only is his father an Edomite, his mother is from Cyprus. She is an Ishmaelite, uh, another group of people that were despised by the Jews. So here you have as king an Edomite-Ishmaelite, not a good combination. It would have been a slap in the face to every Jew in Israel. They are living in an upside down world. Think about this with me. We talked about this last week. Joseph who according to his lineage has legal right to be king, 
instead is serving as a lowly carpenter in Nazareth. He is a righteous man. He's a faithful man. And yet he is a carpenter in Nazareth. All the while you have an Edomite, an Ishmaelite, sitting on the throne over Israel. This is a messed up situation. Now, as messed up as Herod was, he did have one redeeming quality. He was a great builder. He was an incredibly uh, gifted architect. If you go to Israel, which if you ever have the opportunity to do, I would encourage you to do so. But if you have the opportunity to go, you need to study up on Herod because there will not really be a place that you don't go where you will not see some of Herod's mark. He built the temple as, as it, uh, some of its remains exist today. It was an incredible architectural feat. He did it, in fact, to try to win favor with the Jews. He knew the Jews didn't like him. And he thought by rebuilding the temple, he might gain their favor and it didn't really work but he changed the landscape of Jerusalem he built these re, uh, almost retaining walls the wailing wall the western wall that still remains there today but an incredible architectural feat he built Antonio Fortress which is just off the Temple Mount which is a beautiful structure that was built in honor of uh, Mark Antony he built Caesarea Maritime this man-made port Israel didn't really even there though they were a coastal nation they didn't really have a port a safe port he built built a man-made port where ships could dock. And then he built a palace there at Caesarea Maritime. It's a beautiful place. And you can still see some of the foundations of that palace today. And there at Caesarea Maritime, you'll also see the aqueducts that he created to bring fresh water down to Caesarea Maritime. He built a, a winter palace at Jericho. He built Masada, an incredible architectural feat, which by the way, is very high up in the air. So if you don't like heights like me, it's a very scary place to be. Um, just a side note, that was free. I don't know why I brought that up, but that's there. Masada, it's an incredible place. You got to go there if you go to Israel. So all these great architectural feats. As great an architect as he was, this was a horrible individual. Um, he was a paranoid schizophrenic. He was a classic politician. <laughs> he would do whatever he could to take power, and he would do whatever necessary to keep that power. He killed his father-in-law, who was appointed by Rome as the high priest. He killed him. He killed his own wife. He killed his two sons, all at different times, because at one point or another, he thought they were trying to usurp his power. One person said he never met a problem that he couldn't fix with a good murder. You know, this was one bad guy. You didn't mess with him. So as we'll learn next week, killing off every Jew, Jewish boy below the age of two would have been no problem for this individual. A very, very immoral man. So a dark day for Israel. In fact, they were probably thinking, how could it get any worse? This is as bad as it can possibly get. We're a vassal state. We've got this Edomite sitting on the throne ruling over us. A very dark day. Any of you ever think that today? Boy, how could it get any worse? It's a dark day. But remember this, as they're going to learn when the day is the darkest, the light shines the brightest. And the light of God, by the form of a star, is going to begin to shine in the midst of this dark day. And it's going to bring these distant seekers in. So as we consider the context, we also got to consider who are these magi? Who are these distant seekers that are coming uh, to meet the king of the Jews? The Greek word for magi, magi, uh, the word we have there is just a transliteration, but it literally is most often translated wise men. It was a, a class of um, Persian wise men who were interpreters of signs. And these men are obviously astrologers. They're pagans. They were not monotheists. And the question that is often asked, where did they get their knowledge of uh, Christ, the Messiah, and this star? Now, there's a lot of speculation. Most believe that they came from Babylon. And who was held in captivity in Babylon? The Israelites. And the Israelites had prophets like Jeremiah and Daniel and Isaiah who wrote to the Israelites while they were in captivity. And in their writings were prophecies concerning the Messiah, even a star that would precede the Messiah. So there's some thought that these Magi had access to the word of God and the prophecies of the Christ, and they were looking for the Savior who would come. 
There's others who would say, well, maybe God just showed up to them in a dream. And of course, he could have done that. He is going to do that. In verse 12, God's going to show up to them in a dream, and he's going to direct them away from Herod. There's a lot we don't know. Here's what we do know. According to Jeremiah 29, 13, it says, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Meaning this. I don't care where you're at, who you are, where you've been, or what you're going through. I believe this with all my heart. If you will like these magi, if you will seek God with a true and sincere heart, I believe you'll find him. God doesn't play cat and mouse. He's not trying to be elusive to you. If you will seek him with a true and sincere heart, you'll find him. Do you know Romans chapter 1 tells us that God has placed a knowledge of himself in all of us. And it says that he has revealed himself into, in creation so that we are without excuse. But Romans chapter 1 also says that in our sin, what we choose to do is suppress the truth of who God is in our lives. We don't want to bend the knee to Christ. We'd rather do our own thing. But can I tell you, if God begins to draw you and you begin to seek him with a true heart... I truly believe that you will find him. The reality is there's a lot of people out there that just don't want Christ and they miss him. Even if you read the Christmas story, you'll see that there's a lot of people who completely miss Christ. He was right there in front of them. The, the innkeeper, think about this, the innkeeper. I've often thought about this. He has the savior of the world born in, in his own stable right underneath his own nose and he misses it. One of the greatest moments in salvation history, and he misses it. Why? I don't know. Maybe he was just so busy trying to make a dollar off of all these people who were coming to the city. Maybe he was just too busy, but he missed it. And the same is true today. There's a lot of people out there who are too consumed with earning a dollar, making money, or accumulating more stuff that they never even really consider Christ. Or maybe they're just too busy, and they miss Christ. The scribes and the Pharisees, they missed Christ being born. They were right there. They even told Herod, where he would be born. He'll be born in Bethlehem. But they weren't there. They didn't go after him. They weren't like the Magi. They didn't go seek him out. Why? Can I tell you why? I believe, I believe the scribes and the Pharisees missed it because they didn't want Jesus. They didn't think they needed a savior. They thought they were good to go on their own. And there's a lot of people out there today who would just say, you know what? I don't want to bend the knee to Christ. I don't want to make him Lord. I'd rather do what I want to do. I'm afraid of what I might have to give up when it comes to following Jesus. A lot of people out there miss Christ. But I'll tell you this, I believe that if you'll seek him, like these magi, you'll find him. He'll reveal himself to you. These magi, they're drawn in by God by means of a star, and they find Christ. Now, this star is guiding them, and scripture tells us here that they're looking for a king. Now, if you're looking for the king of the Jews, where are you going to go? You're going to go to Jerusalem. That's where you would assume that he is. So they go to Jerusalem, and the story, I've always thought of this, that they, they kind of went to Jerusalem and went straight to, to, to King Herod. But it doesn't appear that Scripture portrays it that way. It appears that they go into Jerusalem, and they're just talking to people about the fact that they've seen this star, and they've heard that the Savior is born. And so they're kind of stirring up a commotion. Remember, Israel was constantly looking, where's the Messiah? When will he come? And so these people are saying, he's been born, and the star's leading us there. And so this commotion is building, and Herod hears about it, and it says that Herod was troubled. Folks, that is an extreme understatement. You just heard that anybody that tried to usurp his authority, he had them killed off. He is deeply troubled because he thinks, here's somebody who's threatening my power and my authority. And so he brings the, the chief priests and the scribes in and says, tell me where the Messiah is supposed to be born. And they discern accurately from the prophet Micah that the Savior would be born in Bethlehem. So he gathers these magi in for a private meeting. He gathers them in and he says, here's what you need to do if you're looking for Messiah. You probably ought to look in Bethlehem. You go find him. And when you find him, you come back and tell me so I can worship him. Now, what, what was the reality? He didn't want to worship him. He wanted to kill him. He's wanting insider knowledge so he can go take care of him. Listen, right there is an important point we don't want to miss. Satan is going to do everything he can to take out Christ, to, to, to prevent him from going to the cross and dying for the sins of the world. 
And so at every turn, if you read the Gospels as we work our way through Matthew, at every turn, Satan is attempting to take out Christ. Now, what we need to know about this today is Christ has already won, amen? He went to the cross, he died, he defeated sin, Satan, and death in his death and in his resurrection. Who now does Satan set his sights upon? Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, 8, be on the alert because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Do you know this today? Satan has opposed Christ and his people since the very beginning. He hates Christ and therefore he hates his followers. And if you are seeking to follow Christ, can I tell you this morning, you have a target on your back. That's why Peter says, you better be on the alert because Satan is looking for someone to devour. And you know what his favorite food is? It's effective Christians. You remember those far side calendars that we used to get? And there was one that had this, this deer and, and, and the deer had a target on his side and one of the other deer walks up and goes, bummer birthmark, dude. That's a bad deal right there. But I'm just gonna tell you, if you seek to follow Christ... If you're going to seek to follow Christ and make a difference for him in this world, you just put a target on yourself. And if you ignore that, you ignore it to your own peril. You have an enemy who wants to take you out. And so right here we see Satan countering God's move to bring about salvation for his people. Didn't we see it in Esther? Satan worked through Haman to try to destroy the people of Israel so he could kill off the line that would bring about the Messiah. So in the midst of this, here's this context. You have a dark day. You have Satan working. And in the midst of this, God's light is beginning to shine. And even in the midst of this darkness, isn't this important for us to remember today? I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what darkness you're facing today. Can I tell you today, never forget this. God's still at work. It was dark, but God was working. And even in the midst of that darkness, he's drawing these guys in. And what we're going to see with the Magi is we're going to see a conversion. They're going to demonstrate really three marks of salvation. That for all of us, if you, if you know Christ today, these attributes ought to mark your life as well. Three things we see in their conversion. Number one, they rejoiced. Look at verses nine through 10. After hearing the king, they went their way and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. I think these magi, this is just my opinion, but I think they've tried a whole lot of other religions. I think these guys were interpreters of signs. These were essentially the educated elite. And they're, they're, they've tried a lot of other ways to get to God. And they have worn themselves out with works and religion. And now they hear about a Savior who has come for them. And when they meet Jesus and they recognize him and what he has done, they are filled with joy. Folks, when you realize that all the work has already been done for you and the Savior has come and all you've got to do is place your faith in him and your life can be transformed and your eternal destination secured, you can't help but have joy in your heart. Amen? There should be no more joyful people in the world then Christians, 1 Peter chapter 1, though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him. And Peter says, you are filled with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Folks, there is no such thing. It is an oxymoron to say grumpy and Christian in the same sentence. They don't exist. Right, Brother Jerry? We don't allow them at LBC. No grumpy Christians here. All right? No grumpies at LBC. And with all seriousness, though, listen to me. If you know Jesus today and your heart is grumpy and you're filled with anger and frustration and bitterness, you need to do a heart check. We talk about going to the cardiologist and get your heart checked. 
There are symptoms that tell you you need to go to the cardiologist. Can I tell you, if your heart is filled with anger and bitterness, you need to go to the great physician Jesus and ask him to reveal to you what's wrong. Because if you know Jesus, you can't help but have joy. These men rejoiced. Not only did they rejoice, but look at verse 11. They worshiped. They worshiped. It says in verse 11, after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So these men, they come into the presence of their Savior, Jesus, and they fall on their knees and they worship. You see, when you come into the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, you don't start running your mouth. You just fall on your knees in the light of the glory and the grace of God. You bend the knee and you worship. And they not only worshiped with their actions, they worshiped with their gifts. A lot of speculation about these gifts. What do they mean? What were they? But all the commentators agree that every one of these gifts were of great Value, meaning they didn't give their comfortable least, they gave their sacrificial best. See, in light of what Christ has done for us, is it enough to just tip the hat and say thank you and then go on our way? I don't think it's possible. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brethren, in light of the mercies of God, to offer your bodies holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. You know that word spiritual? I love that word. In the Greek, it's the Greek word logikain. It's the word from which we get logical. Do you know what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 12, verse 1? The only logical response to the one who gave everything to you is to give everything back to him in service. You worship You give your life back to him. Jesus deserves the best of our energies, the best of our efforts, the best of our times. We worship. Not only did they worship, but they were changed. Look at verse 12. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. They will leave differently than when they came. You remember the story of the Gerasene demoniac in John chapter 4? Here is a garrison demoniac that was uncontrollable. He was a danger to himself and he was a danger to others. Do you know that's a picture of fallen man apart from Christ? We're a danger to ourselves and we're a danger to others. And they can't do anything with him. Society can't change him. Education, medicine, it won't do any good. They just chain him up in the graveyard because he's as good as dead. And he has an encounter with Jesus. You know what it says? He's clothed, seated, and in his right mind. Christ has radically transformed his life. You know, in every encounter that, uh, that Christ has with a person who comes to know him, they leave differently than when they came. You can't know Christ and not change. If you don't like change, you're going to struggle with knowing Jesus because you can't know Christ and not be changed. He will transform you. He will grow you day by day into the image of Christ. Now, know this today. That doesn't mean he doesn't love you where you're at. God loves you right where you're at today. Wherever you might be, he loves you, but he won't leave you there. You can't know him and not change. So do you see these magi? They're distant. They're far off. And yet the light of Christ begins to draw them in. They respond, they meet up with Jesus, and they leave differently than when they came. And there's a good chance some of you are here today and you are far off to God, from God. Some of you are far away from God and you know it. And maybe it's just simply because you've never even really considered your need of Christ. You've never given much thought of it. Maybe you're far off from God because you know you've been running from God. You didn't want to bend the knee. Maybe you're afraid of what you might have to give up as you come to Christ. Can I tell you, if you're here today and you're far off from God because you haven't considered it or because you're running from him, either way, God loves you and Jesus came for you. And I don't know what you're afraid of. Maybe you're afraid of what you might have to give up. But can I tell you, whatever you give up, the treasure you find in Jesus will be worth anything you leave behind. 
I can guarantee it today. Jesus came to take sinners who were far away and draw them near. And I, I don't think we, we can fully grasp this. It's the 11 o'clock. Y'all got time, right? I mean, we're going to be back here at 5 anyway, so we, we might as well camp out. We got lunch. I was thinking about this this morning. We, we, far away, Gentiles. If you were to take the Temple Mount, and if you were able in Jesus' time to fly over it in a helicopter, you would have seen concentric circles moving outward. In the inner circle, you would have seen the court of the priests. And you had to be from the tribe of Levi to get in there. And then you move out from there and you had the court of the Jews, which you had to be a Jewish male to get in there. And then you had the court of the women and you had to be a Jewish woman to get in there. And then you went past a barricade and you would go down five steps and you would come to another wall and another barricade and you'd go down another 14 steps and then you'd enter out onto kind of a flattened plateau area. You know what that was? It was the court of the Gentiles. That was as close as somebody like me could have gotten. That's what the Jew thought of us. That they would look down two barricades. And in front of that one barricade, there was a sign that basically said, if you pass here, you could die. You remember, Paul was accused of bringing Trophimus beyond that place, and they almost killed them both, even though he didn't even do it. But there was one other place in the center of that that was called the Holy of Holies. And in that place, it wasn't a place, there wasn't walls there to keep Jews and Gentiles and men and women separate. It was to keep all people from God. Because if you came in the presence of God, every Old Testament Jew, you're probably good as dead. Just as if, if God were to peel back the veil today and we were to see his glory. I wouldn't be standing here preaching and you wouldn't be sitting there listening. All of us would be on our face worshiping the King of Kings. But that Holy of Holies... And inside that Holy of Holies was the ark. And you remember, it was God's demonstration. You don't just approach me any way you want. You remember the ark in Eli's day in, in 1 Samuel. The, the Philistines, they stole the ark. Do you remember that? And the Philistines, they, they, they kept it. And, and, and what happened? They all got tumors. And they said, we don't want this thing anymore. And they sent it back on a cart with cows. And they sent it and it went to a place called Beth Shemesh. And it showed up in Beth Shemesh. And they were like, wow, the Ark of the Covenant is here. I was, I've always wanted to look and see what's on the inside of that thing. And they open the top of the Ark. And what happens? 50,000 men fall over dead. And they say, whoa. And they close it up and they put it in a man's house. And eventually David says, you know what? I'd really like that Ark here. And he sends to go get it. And you remember, he's got this guy named Uzzah and they're bringing it over and yet the ark starts to tumble and Uzzah puts his hands up and he touches the ark and he falls over dead. In fact, David gets quite angry with God. What in the world is going on here? And God is teaching them, you don't just come to me on your basis. And you remember there was even a king, King Uzziah, who got a little arrogant. He was actually a good king, but he got arrogant and thought he could go into the presence of God on his own and he ran in there and guess what happened? He got leprosy and he died a leper. All of these pictures to remind us, you don't come into my presence. I am holy and you are sinful. There's one time in scripture where the veil is torn from top to bottom and God invites all men to come. Do you remember that point? When Jesus hangs on the cross and he says, it is finished the veil is torn from top to bottom and now God says come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest and he ushers all of us in even a filthy Gentile like me. He ushers all of us in and he calls us what? He calls us his children Romans chapter 8, that we've not been given a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but be, we've been given a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. And what do you do with your dad? 
You don't call his secretary and ask if I can schedule a meeting with dad. No, when he's your father, you just go right into his presence. How do you become a child of God? By faith. I'm a child of Dan McDonald because I was born of Dan McDonald. I'm also a Christian because I was born of Christ. How are you born of Christ? By faith. You trust in Jesus today and you are ushered into God's family. He becomes your father and you are drawn near to him. If you are here today and you feel far away from God, can I tell you, he is calling you today saying, come to me. Trust Jesus and you will become my child. Those who are distant, brought near through Jesus. Let's pray together. God, we we come before you this morning and God, we are grateful that all of us, Jew and Gentile alike, there's no way we could enter into your presence on our own. We were far too sinful. You are far too holy. And yet you loved us. And so you sent your son. And he is the light of the world. And he created a way He lived a perfect and sinless life. He died on the cross. He conquered and defeated death in the grave through his death and his resurrection. He's made a way. And now what is he doing? He's saying to all of us who are far away, come near. There's a way back to God. But you don't get to pick your way. God says you come this way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. God, I pray if there's somebody here that doesn't know you, that feels distant and far away today, today they would trust you with all their heart and they would become your child and know your love and experience it today, the security of your love that tells them they will never be alone and they will be with you forever. God, for those of us that do know you, what a great privilege we have every day to come into your presence. We have a privilege that no Old Testament Jew, no matter how holy they were, we have a privilege every moment of every day that no Jew ever could know. The ability to walk into your presence, to simply pray, and to know through Christ you hear our prayers, to open your word and to hear your voice. God, may we not take this for granted. May every moment of every day we live in awe and wonder of what you've done for us by ushering us near. Those who were distant, like these magi, brought near through the grace of Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen. This time I want to invite you to stand with me as we give you an opportunity to respond in whatever way God might be leading on your heart. Maybe you have questions about salvation, how you can know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, how you can become a child of God through faith in Christ. There'll be pastors here at the front who would love to talk with you and pray with you. Maybe you'd like to become a member of Lenexa Baptist Church to join this church family. I say this often, we all need two things. We all need Christ, we all need each other. So if you don't have a community of faith, a body of believers, we'd love to receive you this morning to become a member of this church family. Maybe you just need prayer. This is your time, know this today, you'll never regret obeying Jesus. You respond as we sing.